If you'll remain standing for the reading of God's Word as we continue on in our exposition of the book of Acts, this morning looking at Acts chapter 21, verses 1 through 16. There we read these words. And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beaches, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Potolmes, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. We entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were there, staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. Recently, I heard an interview with the NFL quarterback, Tom Brady, and he was talking about raising children and the challenges of that. And he mentioned that he was trying to instill in his children that what they have as a family is not the norm, meaning not everyone flies on private jets. Not everyone has people waiting for them to provide their every need. Not everyone has several homes and goes on lavish vacations and have and do whatever one wants. In other words, Tom Brady does not want his children to have a privileged attitude or to be spoiled. Instead, he wants them to know that in life it's going to take hard work and that nothing will come easy. Now, it'd be very easy for us to listen to those comments and, in a sense, roll our eyes and say, well, of course, that is not the norm. No one lives like that. You all live better than royalty. And we would might want to say to him, live my life for a while. Then you would know what hard work really looks like. Then you would know what it's like to do without and whereas that may be true to some degree, none of us live like the Bradys, what I'd have to say to each and every one of us is that what we have, that is, as Americans, is also not the norm. Even the poorest of the poor Americans probably still live better than half the world's population. And that is not to guilt or shame you as Americans. What we have is tremendously a blessing. It's a blessing of God. But to rather realize that we are very much shaped and influenced by our culture. And yet, oftentimes, we do not recognize it. Because we compare ourselves, or when we do, we compare ourselves to those that are right around us. Those that are other Americans having that which we have, and oftentimes those that have much more than what we have. And that is true, isn't it? It doesn't matter how much you have. There's always somebody with more or better. 
and that we can go without. And we can begin to think, well, you know, it would really be nice if I had this or that, like so-and-so does over here. And we can even begin to think and perhaps even say, perhaps not out loud, but to ourselves, woe is me. My life, my means are so meager. Yet the reality is that we have more than enough, don't we? In fact, we live in abundance. We've never missed a meal. We've always had proper provision. And so my problems are really not real problems compared to most of the world. My problems are what I like to call first world problems. That the internet is down for an hour. That our AC is not working as properly as it should. We run out of water, hot water, when we're in the shower. We have nothing to wear while walking in a walk-in closet full of clothes. Again, I say those things not to make light of or diminish, but to say we need perspective. And we most definitely need biblical perspective. We are blessed. And yet, are we willing to go without? If the Lord, in his choosing, would see to take away those blessings from us. Can I say, will I say, the Lord's will be done? Well, as the Apostle Paul makes his way back to Jerusalem, he demonstrates that attitude. Thy will be done, even to his own hurts, even to his very own pain, and even to his life literally being taken away. He does not put himself or what he wants first. Rather, he dies to self again and again. And in so doing, what we see in this passage, that he slays a lot of things that are very precious to me and perhaps to you as well. He slays a lot of what I would like to call American idols. And we'll see that this morning in three points. Kingdom over calendar. Kingdom over comfort. And kingdom over convenience. First, kingdom over calendar. As we saw last week in chapter 20, this message to the Ephesian elders, that Paul says to those elders that they need to pay attention First to oneself, as well as to the flock of God there in Ephesus. And he says so because we have an enemy that prowls around like a a roaring lion that seeks to destroy. Paul says that will come in the form of ravenous wolves that will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And the model that he gives of wolves versus a true shepherd is himself. He says, you know yourselves how I lived among you. The example that was set by my life and by my ministry. And he gives his own life as an example of what a true shepherd looks like. Oh, Paul here as well is quite an example His life stands out, doesn't it? And a few things that we see along those lines is there in verse 1 as it says, and when we had parted from them, that is those elders from Ephesus, we set sail. Now that word to part literally means to, to tear apart. And that's what had to happen between these elders and the apostle Paul so was the love, so was the affection that they literally had to be torn apart from each other. These Ephesian elders did not want Paul to go. And no doubt, Paul did not want to leave them knowing that he would not see them again. And so they had to be torn apart, torn from one another. 
It's words full of emotion. It's words full of love. And what is amazing about that is you need to remember that most likely these Ephesian elders were Greeks. They were Gentiles. They were part of Asia Minor. And yet their ethnicity did not matter to Paul. It did not matter to these elders. Their love for Christ, their love for one another far, far exceeded any of that. And so what you see here and what you must not miss is that you see Jews and Gentiles hugging and embracing and kissing one another, which would not have been very common in that day. And guess what? It's still not common this day. Meaning, when we see people that are very different, everything from skin color to their age or their demographics, that we put those things aside as we come together as a church. Church is not determined by our skin color, is it? It's determined by the love of our hearts. Jesus said, you will know my disciples, not by their eye color, not by their hair color, but by their love. Is that true of Smyrna Presbyterian Church? I think it is. And praise God for it. May it be so, even more so. But what we then read throughout this passage is that seemingly reads like a travel log rather than a Bible passage. We read that they stayed here and then they went there and they stayed a few days here and then seven days there and you can literally follow it on a map. But what I want you to notice in the midst of this passage, in the midst of this travelogue, is what Paul does. In every place, he seeks out believers in that place. We just saw it in chapter 20, right? He goes to Miletus, and what does he do? He calls for the Ephesian elders to come down. We see in verse 3 that they landed at Tyre, and then in verse 4, having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. Same thing, verse 7, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed. Same thing on verse 8, on the next day we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist. You can go down in verse 16, and we went to Caesarea, and we went to Jerusalem, staying at the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple. And then even into verse 17, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. And so at every stop on this, what could be called a farewell tour of Paul, he met with the believers in that place. Some that he had known from previous missionary journeys and others he did not. And yet it was important to him. He deliberately made a point to seek, to find, to greet. All very much action verbs. In other words, Paul was not passive. Rather, he was very active. And I find that very striking because if there was ever a person that deserved a little bit of R&R, it would have been the Apostle Paul. Coming back from a multi-year, multi-destination missionary journey, journey, I cannot even imagine how exhausted he must have been. And then being told that as he goes to Jerusalem, you are going to be imprisoned and you are going to most likely lose your life. You think what we would read instead of what we do read is Paul saying to his fellow travel companions, Luke and the rest, I'm a bit tired. I need some time. I have a lot on my heart. I have a lot on my mind. I need to use this journey back to Jerusalem to kind of be restored, to be refreshed. I need some me time. And so, as we sail through these stops, let's just stay on the down low. Let's stay quiet. We'll just be there for a few days, and then we'll be on our way. 
Perhaps you've done something similar yourselves, going on travel or on vacation. Your spouse may say to you, doesn't so-and-so live here? And you go, shh, (laughs) nobody needs to know that we are here. We're going to come in, we're going to be incognito, we're going to go stealth mode, and then we'll be gone, right? That's not what Paul said or did. And I'm not saying that there is not a place for that. But if that is the pattern, if that is the norm, that we are trying to have avoidance of people, especially avoidance of the church, then I would say that this passage would say to us something is out of whack in our life. Remember, the Apostle Paul was on a schedule. He needed to be back in Jerusalem by Pentecost. In other words, he had places to go and people to see. And it would have been very easy for to say, we're going to go in and we're going to get out. That is not the pattern. He sought out the brethren. He prioritized people, specifically Christians, specifically the church, and every place that he went. He prioritized these things over his schedule. It was indeed kingdom over calendar. And that is convicting, at least it's convicting to me, because I love calendars. (laughs) I have a calendar on my phone. It's probably the most used app. You can ask me about any time in this upcoming week, Tuesdays at 3, Thursdays at 4.30 p.m., and I can most likely tell you not only where I'm going to be, but what I am going to be doing at that specific time. My wife and I sync our calendars all of the time. We talk about our weekly schedule. Deborah keeps a, a master calendar for us here at the church. I love calendars. And we need calendars. We need schedules. They're helpful. They're functional. They're profitable. They're very helpful tools. Let me remind you that that is exactly what they are. They're just a tool. Your calendar, your schedule is not your master. It is not your Lord. The Lord is your Lord. And there is oftentimes in our life times and places where the Lord might have very different plans, very different schedules, very different priorities for you. And that is okay. In fact, it is better than okay. Because does not the Lord say, my ways are not your ways? And my plans and my thoughts are are not your plans and not your thoughts. And yet, how often do we chafe against it? And even worse, perhaps blow opportunities that the Lord puts right in front of us. Why? Because we will not be inconvenienced by interruptions or detours to our schedules or what we need to accomplish I tell you, as I suffered my injury and I blew out my Achilles, as most of you know, as I was sitting in the waiting room of the urgent care, pretty confident of what I had done, I was not a happy camper. But it was not because of my injury or not because of the pain, even though there was a lot of that. It was because I knew what I had planned Specifically, my upcoming, at that time, sabbatical. That those plans were going to be radically changed. In a moment, it went up in a puff. And that's how I looked at it. That these were my plans. This was my sabbatical. And I was not okay with the Lord taking it away from me. And if I was honest, it took days. And I was devastated over it. More than I was devastated over my own leg. 
And it really was a slow submission to the Lord, to my very own shame. And perhaps you know the feeling. Perhaps you have experienced something similar. How many times when you've had sick kids, or perhaps your kids were on summer break, or perhaps when you had an emergency at work, or something broke, or the car broke down, or the boss gave you something to do that was not on your plan, not on your plate, and when you finish that day, you get home and you go to your spouse, to someone else, I got nothing accomplished today. The reality is you probably got a lot accomplished. You just got nothing accomplished that you thought you needed to accomplish. C.S. Lewis says this, the great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things that happen as an interruption of one's own life or one's real life. The truth is, of course, what one calls the interruptions are precisely one's real life. That is, the life God is sending. And the ones that we call, quote unquote, real life is a phantom of one's own imagination. Those are convicting words, aren't they? But if the Lord is the Lord, and he is, and he's not only just the Lord over our body, not only the Lord over our possessions, but he's also the Lord over our time. Obviously, the beginning of when we are born and the end when we die, but we have to remind ourselves as reformed people that believe God is sovereign over everything that he's reformed, and he's sovereign over everything in between as well. That means the Mondays at 3 p.m. or 3 a.m. or Fridays at 5 and every other time in between. Again, we should not fly by the seat of our pants and have anything goes, but at the same time, we need to be open to what God desires of our schedules, of our calendars. We need to be open to God-ordained detours. That's what we read in the story of the Good Samaritan, isn't it? The priest and the Levites came by and they saw this poor man that was beaten and bruised. And they, no doubt, knew that he needed help. And yet, what does it say? They passed on the other side. And no doubt, they had to justify that in their own hearts and in their own minds. And perhaps they said to themselves, you know, I would help. But someone's waiting on me. I can't be late. I need to, to go and accomplish that task, that duty and I just don't have time. And yet what is most convicting is that the man that had the best excuse, the most legitimate reason not to help, helps. The Samaritan helps the Jew. In fact, he goes above and beyond. These were two people that did not associate under the best of circumstances, let alone in the worst. And yet this Samaritan puts his concern, his prejudice even, his schedule aside. Why? Because it says that he had compassion. His compassion trumped all else. And what Paul does here is much the same. He could have been very easily able to say, you know, if under better circumstances, I would love to be with these people, but I need to get to Jerusalem. And yet he yielded to self, he died to self, he even sought after it. He had a heart of love, a heart of compassion for the, the church. It reminds you of our Lord, doesn't it? When we read in the Gospels that after many days of ministering, he, he desired to get his disciples away, and he tells them to get into a boat so that they could go to the other side. And yet what happened People found out exactly where he was going and beat him there. And so when he comes to the other side of the shore, there were not only just a few, but there was crowds already assembled. And so what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus just shoes them away, right? No. 
This is in Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus put people over even his own scheduled priorities. Again, hear me right, it's not wrong to have boundaries. That's good and healthy. It's not everything is an emergent need. Not everything happens, needs to happen right this moment. We do not want to be man pleasers that are at the whim and beck and call of, of all, but we need to also not view our life and our times as just that, ours, because they are not. They are the Lord's times. Our life is his own. Our life is not precious or of value, as we talked about last week, but Christ is valuable, and he is precious. And so it is not just my time. All my time is the Lord's time. And the Lord indeed is, is a good God. He doesn't make us work 24-7. He indeed gives us rest. That's what we are to enjoy on a Sabbath day is to enjoy very good rest. We do not want to, to be uh, those that are um, Mary's, or excuse me, Martha's. We want to be Mary's that sit at the feet of Christ. But we want to recognize that all of our work all of our play, all of our rest, all of our scheduled time, even our unscheduled time, all belongs to him. I know a man that writes at the top of his day planner every week, Proverbs 16, 9. Man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. That's a wonderful verse to put at the top of a day planner. We are to live our lives as R.C. Sproul used to say, Coram Deo, which is Latin for before the face of God. And he said, to live Coram Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, to the glory of God. That is a right worldview. And so, as I tell you, let us plan, let us schedule, but also let us pray. Lord, these are my plans, but would you please direct my steps? I'm a servant to you, not a servant to my schedule. Well, second, that's not convicting enough. We have more. We see kingdom over comfort. As Paul goes to Caesarea, he goes into the house of Philip, who is one of the seven who is one of the deacons, but we see that he's not known as Philip the deacon. He's known as Philip the evangelist because, indeed, he was a proclaimer of the gospel and in that way was an evangelist. We saw that already in Acts chapter 8 as he goes and finds this Ethiopian eunuch on his way back home reading the scroll of Isaiah, and he asks him if he knows what he's reading. The man says that he does not. And so it is told that Philip told him the good news of Christ. We see that his evangelism started at home. It says that he had four daughters, four unmarried or virgin daughters. Now, assuming that they were not young, it would have been odd to have four unmarried daughters that were of marrying age. And so no doubt they had taken a vow or perhaps had the gift of celibacy. And there alone might be a lesson of kingdom over comfort. To be reminded that being single is not a curse. That there's not something wrong with you or it's not nece necessarily something that has to be corrected. That is a good reminder for all of us as a church, especially with singles amongst us. Paul says that it is a, a blessing, especially when it's used for the kingdom. In fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 7, I wish all were like me, meaning being single. And so no doubt, these four daughters of, of Philip were greatly used by the Lord in their singleness. And that is what we read. It says that they were given prophecy. They were prophetess, a, a sign of a very special work of God. We read of that in Peter's preaching at Pentecost and 
He cites Joel, the prophecy of Joel, which says that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. And they, along with Agabus here, who we also have met in chapter 11, give a prophecy that Paul most definitely will be arrested upon arrival in Jerusalem. In fact, we read that Paul, or excuse me, Agabus, acts out his prophecy towards Paul, saying that he will be bound up, he will be arrested, he will be imprisoned. The point of all of this is that everywhere Paul went, the Spirit of the Lord, through his people, were saying, you are going to be arrested. We saw that in chapter 20, we see it twice in this passage. And so you would think the conclusion would be, so don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. The Lord is telling you this so that you avoid it. In fact, you go in the opposite direction. In fact, that is what we read throughout this passage is that people were begging him. No doubt that's what the Ephesian elders were begging him. That's why they had to be torn apart from one another because they were probably saying, come back with us to Ephesus. You'll be safe there. We can watch over you. We can protect you. We read that in chapter 4. They were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. You see that in verse 12 where it says, When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. And notice that it means that Luke was telling Paul, Don't go. Don't do this. Why would you go to this place where you know that there is harm, where you know there's going to be imprisonment? No doubt you might even lose your very life. And yet, Paul goes. And you might ask, who is right, them or Paul? Was the Spirit saying this so as to to not go? Or was he saying this so as to go? And the answer is, I don't know. And I don't know if there is a right answer. And I don't think that they exactly knew either. It demonstrates that Discerning the Lord's will is not always cut or dry, is it? The Lord doesn't always write everything in the sky of what you should do or what you should not do in the way that you should go. Obviously, he gives us what we are to do morally, and we're never to violate that, but what actions we are to do in our life, what vocations we are to take, who we are to marry, he doesn't say this is the way or that is the way. We must use wisdom, discernment, wise counsel, But it seems that his mind was made up. In fact, it says in verse 14, when we understood that we could not persuade him, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Paul's mind had been made up. He could not be persuaded. All the women in here are saying, so you're saying he was a man and wouldn't listen. Yes, the apostle Paul was a man, perhaps even a little bit hard-headed, But regardless of what you think Paul did, if it was right or if it was wrong, you notice his attitude. You notice what he says in verse 13. What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I'm ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. That was the mindset of the Apostle Paul. Is that our mindset? Not saying that our life is on the line, but if our life was on the line, would that be our attitude? Again, as people that so greatly value our comfort and value our security, people that oftentimes, and I'm the same way, when something looks hard or something looks dangerous, we want to go, you know, I think I'm going to do the opposite. Not the Apostle Paul. He says, I know what is being said. I've heard it again and again, and yet I believe the Lord wants me to go. He's calling me to Jerusalem. He's calling me to imprisonment. He's calling me even to death. I will be a prisoner for Christ. I will be a martyr for Christ. Now, this does not mean that we throw caution to the wind or tempt the Lord's fate. But again, I think that is so rarely the case for us. 
that we too much fall on the other side, when we perceive that there is any danger, when we perceive that there is any risk, when we perceive that our security, our comfort may somehow be lessened, we go, perhaps not. It's high on our scale of concerns, isn't it? Comfortability. And often, may I say it, we're a little too comfortable. In fact, that may be our MO. That is, if I feel uncomfortable or I feel afraid, then I'm not going to do it. And if that is your attitude, then I would have to say to you that you'll never venture to do much of anything especially for the Lord. If there's not a bit of a gamble, if there's not a bit of a risk, then you'll never make progress. And if that is true individually, then that is very much true of us as a church, not just this church, but all churches. We can play it safe in the church, can't we? We can very easily say, we're good. All is good here. Let me say to you, or perhaps even ask, is the world good? If the world is not good, then we can't be good. Meaning that the world will not be good until Jesus comes back. So we cannot say we're good here. We don't need to change anything up. We don't need to do any other ministry. We don't need to to pray anything that would make us feel uncomfortable. No, we need to be on a mission. And when we say that we are good, we're not on a mission. We're no longer marching. And ultimately, we're no longer following the Lord. Because the Lord does not put our comfort as his highest priority. I'm sorry, he doesn't. We can find great comfort in him. That's what we confess with the Heidelberg Catechism, isn't it? My only comfort in life and death is that I'm not my own, but belong body and soul to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. There is great comfort in Christ, but we do not say my only comfort is in my security or in my circumstances or my situation. Oftentimes that needs to die many a death. So let me ask you, when's the last time you've been outside of your quote-unquote comfort zone for the sake of Christ? And I'm not saying you have to pack everything up and go to some far-off country. Perhaps just teaching the fourth graders or the four-year-olds may be uncomfortable enough. Believe me, they can be hoodlums in themselves. And so I can't tell you exactly what that means in your life or what areas that may put at risk. But I would say that that's something that we need to start praying. And it's a dangerous prayer, isn't it? Lord, what are areas that I'm too comfortable? Make me uncomfortable if it be for you, for your ways, for your will. And pray that for us as a church as well, that we would go forth with a bold humility, as we talked about last week. But as Paul says to these people, what are you doing? It reminds me again of our Lord. And he told his disciples, revealed to them that he must suffer many things, that he must be killed and on the third day rise again. You remember what Peter does. He pulls the Lord aside, and he rebukes him. He says, Jesus, far be it from you. This shall never happen to you. And it's one of the strongest rebukes that we have of Jesus towards one of his disciples. You remember what he says to Peter? He says to him, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then goes on to say, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We hear that verse so often, but it comes in the context of suffering, doesn't it? 
And if suffering is not in our vocabulary, then I have to say, then you cannot be a disciple of Christ. Name anyone that is used by God, anyone in the Bible, anyone in church history, I'll show you someone that suffered for the sake of Christ and for his kingdom. Again, you you need not look for it. You need not seek it out. But through simple, faithful following of Christ, it will bring about cross-bearing. It will, and it must. And so let me ask you as we close this morning, are you okay with that? Young people especially, listen to me. Are you okay with that? You of all of us may need to know what it means to suffer for Christ in this world and in this culture. And you must come to grips with that reality. And all of it is very un-American, isn't it? But that is okay. We are Christians before we are Americans. And so therefore, would we pray as we prayed this morning, Lord, your will be done on earth, in my life, as it is in heaven. And so calendars and comforts, and Lord willing, we will look next week at conveniences. But we say this morning, that Christ, we offer them up to you as sacrifices because they are yours and you are greater. You are better. Amen.